I was the fourth oldest. My name is Richard, and I live in Oceanside, California. And I came here just for this occasion mm -hmm. and to see my siblings. <laughs> I'm Jean Fry. I'm one of the your number the six six of the <laughs> ten children, and I am the author's daughter. And I'm Kay, Marlene Kay. I have a twin sister that's not here. And I'm number seven of 10, and she's eight of 10, of course. And um, I'm from Kendallville, and so is she. So we've lived here all our lives. <laughs> I'm Mike, I'm uh, the ninth of the 10 children, and I live in Auburn. Yeah. And my name is Dean, and I'm the fifth, and I'm Jean's twin. And, uh, and, uh, I, oh, I said I'm the fifth, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, Angie, it's always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Angie Mapes Turner. I'm, um, the, I'm the poet's granddaughter, uh, and this is my dad, Mike, right here. I'm April Mapes Johnson, and I'm the oldest grandchild, and I live here in Kendallville. And my name is Pamela Mapes Botcher. And I am the second oldest grandchild. I don't know which grandchild I am, like 20 something. <laughs> <laughs> Mom would go to town shopping. We lived out in England Road, country, and, and uh, Dad's supposed to be watching us kids. Well, he would be at the kitchen table, and that's where he wrote the poem, Indiana and didn't know what we were doing. We were having fun. <laughs> but that's the way Dad was. He'd get something in his head and he'd just jot it right down. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to say that growing up, yeah. I didn't think this was anything special. I thought everybody's dad sat mm -hmm. down and wrote a poem after supper, you know. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, did, I didn't know any other, other way of life. Just, it just seemed natural to me that that's what dads did. Yeah. Dad had this old uh, royal typewriter and he'd just peck away on that thing. But uh, during the day, he was a machinist at Flint and Walling here in Kenneville. And uh, in his head, you know, he'd, he'd think about nature and, and uh, the great outdoors. And, and he'd come home and he'd, those thoughts in his head, he'd just, on, on anything, he'd grab a napkin or whatever, and he'd start writing out his poems. <laughs> and so that's, and he did that all through the years, you know. Like Mike said, we kind of used to him writing poems, but yeah. Well, when we were um, putting, getting stuff for the book to put in the book and pictures and things, we would run across poems that we didn't know he would wrote mm -hmm. anywhere. I mean, just years later, sometimes we'd find something that he had wrote. We didn't even know he had it. Yeah. Well, when, when I was seven, I went on a trip to Wisconsin with my dad and my aunt and uncle and their boys. And uh, we went to uh, this place called the Cave of the Mounds, the Wisconsin Dells. And we went to this cave, and then when we got home, dad wrote a poem about it. And it's a beautiful poem. Mm -hmm. it just fit the cave. You know, so that was one of my memories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a grandchild, um, my favorite memory of my grandpa, and nobody's ever going to take this away, was the day we went to Indianapolis and he became the poet laureate of the state. And I, I felt like I could climb mountains mm -hmm. just because each one of his grandchildren at that time, there weren't as many as there are now, but, but at that time, um, for me to be able to sit among the senators and, and all the people in the Congress, to know that my grandpa was the one that read that poem that day. And I, I have the best, best, best memory of him, and that's the very best one. On my dad's side, my uh, grandma Mapes, his mother, I know her, uh, uh, my great grandma wrote poetry, and I have some of her poems. Oh, so, so did Grandma. And so did Grandma. Mm -hmm. Grandma Gene did too. and I didn't know plus, that. Plus, <laughs> he graduated in 33, and if, yeah. you, well, if you look at the old 
old Kennebel yearbooks, yeah. poetry was huge back then. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, yeah. you know, the, the radio was fairly new, they didn't have TV. Yeah. And uh, so writing poems and yeah. reading them, and, and you know, the old yearbooks are full of poems. Yeah. Yeah. He, was, he was selected to write a class poem, and he said that that really, I, I think the, Gosh, you know, the funny. feelings that he evoked in his classmates just mm -hmm. really touched him. Mm -hmm. And made you know yeah. made him feel like that was yeah. a really and I'm special from, thing yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah, and I graduated from the last Kinnebell High School mm. class of '66, and Dad wrote a poem that's called "The Last Class," mm. and that was very special. <laughs> About three or four years ago, we had our 50th reunion, and they made me read that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think in one of the interviews that I read too, um, he said when he was uh, probably like early teens, 13 or so, he wrote a poem about the Spencer, Spencerville Covered Bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think he said that was one of the first, if not the first, that he wrote. And that it really just sort of, you know, set off a spark in him. I think one thing about, one thing about my grandpa that I would, I, I, I appreciate, um, was a bit of a probably inconvenience at times, but he never drove. He walked everywhere. Um, he never had a driver's license. And I think, you know, that sort of, probably gave him a lot of time as he's on these rambles about town, you know, to really appreciate things at a pace that we probably mm -hmm. didn't appreciate, that we don't appreciate things, and maybe, um, you know, it wasn't something that he did consciously, but I can just imagine that that gives you a different perspective on things when you're down there walking in the, on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but a lot of times he would, when we lived in the country, he'd walk back in the woods and spend the whole day just, just being around nature. Several and whatever trees. he'd see or popped in his head, he would, you know, it was up here and he'd come home and he'd write it down. And just the inspiration of being outside. In the woods. Do you have anything to add to that, Angie, with that, <laughs> all the work you've done? Uh -huh. well, yeah. well, unfortunately, I, um, you know, my memories of him I was just a toddler when he died. I was um, about three. And um, so I don't, you know, I didn't get to ask him those questions. And it was probably about, um, I don't know, eight or nine years ago that I started really thinking about it a lot more. And I, I'm a journalist by trade. And so I thought, well, how would I approach this as a journalist? I would just over research it basically. And so I started collecting, you know, all the articles that I could find that had been written about him in the interviews. And one thing I thought was interesting that I think I read is that he would fully form his poems in his mm -hmm. mind yeah, before mm -hmm. writing them down. To, I'm sort of the kind of writer who just sort of, well, let's just put things down and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so to me, like the idea that he just kept it all in his head. And one thing he liked to say, he, he he didn't write poems for children, but it was really important to him that a child could be able to read and understand his poetry. And so I think that also helped him, you know, to memorize it as he was writing because they were, you know, simple verses for the most part, and um, written in a written in a way, you know, that um, was easy to remember. And actually, when I was a kid, um, you know, if we had to memorize a poem for school or something like that, I always did one of my grandpa's poems because number one, I was familiar with them already, but I knew they would be easy enough for me to remember. He had a big uh, regard for nature. And he got that at, a, <clears throat> at an early age when he met this character uh, called Sassafras John. I don't know if you've ever heard of Sassafras John. Okay. He, uh, he used to go around Kinderville selling sassafras roots when Dad was little. And he had a shack on the sunny side. Kinderville, the south side, used to be called Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. And where East Noble School is now, just on the uh, west edge, Sassafras mm -hmm. John had his shack. The lawn just west of the office. Yeah. And Dad bonded with him as a kid. And da Dad's house was where the YMCA is, so they were oh, yeah. okay. really close. Yeah. So they, and Dad's regard that he has for nature and came from his association with Sassafras John. Yeah, and, I think uh, that was part of the reason yeah. it was really important to me to put some of the poems online for people to read because he had published a book in 1980 and um, then in the 90s the siblings got together and published um, some soft cover albums like specialty albums. But since then it had nothing had been in print. It was important to me to make um, the website because the poetry had been published in a book in 1980 and then in some specialty albums in the 1990s, but since then it hadn't been in print and a lot of those 
books, you know, they were at public libraries, but they're not in wide circulation or anything. Um, and I thought, you know, my grandpa was, among many other things, he was a relentless self-promoter of his poetry because he knew nobody was going to come to his house and ask, you know, and ask him to publish. And so he sent his poetry to state senators, he sent it to garden clubs, he sent it to anybody he thought would be interested because it was special to him and he wanted to share it with the world. You know, he felt this was his gift from God and he wanted to share it. And um, so uh, I, I think that um, that was what got me interested in it and I um, was thinking about the Sassafras John poems and they're, they're basically, I think, of his poetry, my favorite poems. And he wrote them in sort of like, uh, like I guess, a patois of, of the way that somebody would have talked, you know, mm -hmm. in that from that time period. And to think that I'm just, you know, one generation removed from somebody who knew this man who lived in the 1800s was really interesting to me. Um, and uh, it's just a way of life that just doesn't exist, you know. He, Sassafras John grew up before cars. Like it's just a Kendallville that's not there anymore. Um, but but he planted tons of the trees that you see around town. Um, John just went around planting trees. Yeah. And so I, I thought, okay, well, this is a way to introduce it to another generation of people. And I think it's it's good for it's good for children to know, you know, where their roots are and where where things came from. John was in his early sixties when I think when Dad was born. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so to to think that, you know, uh, a young kid and, you know, a teenager, you know, was best friends with a guy in his 80s. It's, it's just pretty remarkable, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and the, the Sassafras John poems. I think the, the, the best, best one is the home of Sassafras John, where he, mm -hmm. he describes uh, the shack, the shack where, where he's sat with, with John. And uh, my, my other favorite Sassafras John one is Christmas and Sassafras John. Yeah. Cause I, c I can remember the night that he wrote that. I was, I was probably in junior high school, and uh, and but he he came in from the kitchen in, in the evening and handed me a poem and I read that and I thought, wow, this this is a masterpiece here, and it, it's definitely one of my yeah. favorites. Mm -hmm. 